Uh, Robin's going to do the majority of the heavy lifting here. <laughs> I'm going to kind of jump in for color commentary. So I'm going to give you the microphone. Oh, wait a second. Then, we oh, there's two mics. mics. So we get to have oh. dueling mics. <laughs> so one of the things that Weber's done over the last 10 years is we've really dug in and kind of looked at, you know, different themes coming out of CAN and how that kind of changes the industry going forward and what you could kind of expect, you know, your clients to be asking for, at least the things that they should be paying attention to. So over the last 10 years, you know, we've really, you know, dove deep into those themes and we did the same again this year and that's kind of the focus of this presentation. We're not going to show you a bunch of Weber Shandwick work, we're just going to show you work that we felt really laddered up to this key theme coming out of CAN and then um, we'll break it down for you. Sounds good. Ooh. Okay, so won't spend too much time on the kind of makeup of CAN. Um, I assume everyone here knows all the details of what happens at CAN, but I think what's important to note is that, um, as talked about in the beginning, it really is a barometer of what is about to happen and what will happen. And I think especially because it comes at that June time period, where for five days the sort of you know, world descends upon the marketing world, but actually the real world as well, descends upon the south of France to really kind of just figure out how to make sense of what's been happening in the industry, but also what's about to happen. And the fact that it comes in June is kind of cool because it's the midway point in the year, but it's also when you start to think about planning for next year. And it, it kind of gives you a really good inflection point. So won't spend too much time on like all the specifics here, but everybody knows it's a um, five-day conference where you have uh, conferences and seminars matched with an award show every night, matched with sort of activations from various brands and companies and really newsmakers that are there. And so it is a really good barometer for what's going on. So what we're gonna, Ian and I are going to walk through is really the takeaways from this year, and they're not just from this year. Honestly, as Ian said, we've been we've been following it for ten years, and and really more than that if you kind of like go back. But as Weber, really trying to understand, you know, how do these themes exist together? What are some of the new themes? So we've got about five things that we're going to talk about. The first one is a little bit more on like looking at the Can Lions itself, the festival itself, and some of the changes that they make each year. You can get some cues as to where the industry is going. So as Ian mentioned in the beginning, um, each year as Weber, we really try and you know, isolate one rallying theme that we think kind of defines the work um, and the festival from that year. And I think what's important here is that these, these um, themes don't just stop. It wasn't like Earn Media came out in 2010. It was like, all right, see you, Earn Media. That was just like, that was one and done. These themes actually build over time, and they actually intertwine. And so um, you know, there's pieces of iconic work for each of these era or each of these years, but really, it's about how to make sense of the entire world, incorporating a lot of these themes. Yeah, and one uh, one of the key things, like. Um you know, traditionally, Cannes was always seen as just an advertising festival. So PR award categories really started get you know coming into play around this 2010 time frame. You know, I was there in 2014, and big data was a theme in 2012. But when I was there, there, there was tons of sessions just on you know data and you know kind of how that applies to creativity and things like that. So I think what you what you're seeing is in the past, Cannes kind of had this you know if you had a really cool piece of creative, you know, and you didn't really have any results to back that creative, it still could be Cannes worthy. And now I think just with the shift of things going on, obviously, you know, business and business results being a key theme last year, you have to have, I mean, maybe in some of the uh, more craft categories, you could just have pure creativity and pure design and things like that. But everything's got to be backed by some type of results or effectiveness now to even have a chance at, you know, winning a Grand Prix. So here's the Weber Shanwick super scientific way that we come up with the can themes. Proprietary um, data. Yeah, please, please. Um, really, it's simple, and honestly, like we're going to put out what we think is the theme, but it's you know hopefully afterwards we can talk a little bit about you know what you guys think. But we take a look at the festival setup, what changes they've made to the festival to to understand where the industry is going. We look at the iconic work coming out of it, and this year, like honestly, some of the best work I've personally seen in a long time. Really deep, heavy, um, like society moving work. And then the seminars and the content, you know, what are the big CMOs and CEOs and CCOs coming out and talking about um, and how are brands activating there to mash all of that together into a bolded can theme. So um, the festival setup in and of itself will allow you to kind of take a look at things. So this is just a, a sampling of some of the award categories that were introduced at certain times. And by looking at, you know, it's funny to look at cyber in 1998, like, I mean, it's not called it's not called cyber anymore, but uh, you know you can look at the 
the awards that were introduced in certain years to really understand kind of where the industry is going. You see PR in 2019, integrated in 2007. Yeah, this is crazy. Like they weren't even, you know, like there wasn't even an emphasis on an integrated campaign until this time frame. Yeah, so when Can sees, you know, um, uh, velocity and, and a lot more work in a certain area, like new new areas can open up. So just by looking at the categories that get introduced and new ones get introduced every so often, you can kind of see what's happening in the space. Last year in 2018, the creative e-commerce um, was introduced, and I think you know understanding the end-to-end -end user experience, seeing the increase in um, a lot more creative effectiveness, business-defining ideas. Um, there was a huge increase this year, so I think we'll continue to see a lot more entries in the creative e-commerce, um, in the creative e-commerce. But we'll just continue to see the world kind of move towards this. Um, and new this year, and further to Ian's point about effectiveness, was the creative strategy alliance. Um, you know, really focused on the strategic planning specialism, and that again, it's about business results. It's about what are we, what's the insight we're looking for, what is the creative around it, but then how is that driving um, effectiveness? All the work that we saw, all of the content and seminars that we saw really wrapped around this notion of solutions. You know, how are we going to create ideas that actually solve real world problems, whether those real world problems are like heavy ones or like less heavy ones, but they were all solution based thinking that wrapped in three areas. The first was about channels, and it's not just about like, you know, do we know the best channels to be on, but what is the way we're going to come up with an idea that is as sticky as possible. And we define that as like, it's culturally and contextually relevant. It is newsworthy. It is, um, it is done in the most beautiful way. So every idea we saw really that won and that kind of mattered at Cannes really had this notion of like, how is it, how is it sticky? Like traditionally, this was always kind of more known as this was the creative component. You know, this is something visual, something you could see. If you share it, it's got a face to it. Exactly. Um, but the second thing was that these ideas didn't need to be visually arresting and you know, newsworthy. They also needed to be backed by something. They weren't just things put out there that didn't have something real or tangible or people standing behind them. And so this notion of like, you know, what is the relevance and the credibility for that brand to stand up for this? What, you know, who are the stakeholders involved? And I think more and more you're seeing a lot more big pieces of work come out with you know, real people, real advocates standing behind it. And then is there a way for people to engage in it? Because at the end of the day, it's got to count. It's got to tie back to the business in some way, shape, or form, not just from a KPI perspective and measurement, but sales and distribution and integration. And again, in the past, you'd see big creative ideas that didn't necessarily, you didn't know what the sales results were or the, the business outcomes, but impact was as important as the wrapper. All right, that was takeaway one. Taking a look at what sort of the festival setup was to really understand some of the key trends. The second one, and I think I think this is like both an industry thing and just like a people thing right now. There is a significant tension, I think, like no matter who you are in the world and like what your role is between high touch and high tech. This like it, it's a it's a harder world to live in right now. And I think we're really seeing that come to life in a lot of the work we do for a lot of our clients. So what does that mean? The sort of the the the, the tension between the two. So before CAN started, um, the CAN line organization went out to the industry clients, leaders, and asked, you know, what do you think are the top things and trends that are really defining the industry and that we should talk about at CAN? And there were 10 themes or 10 areas that emerged, and that's, that's right here, according to clients. But if you look at that, it's kind of like, it's a bit overwhelming. There's so much um, information there. So we kind of took it a bit deeper and we said, okay, if these are the 10 things that clients feel really matter and that big brands are really rallying around, well, like, where are the sort of like patterns in this? So there's a high touch perspective here. Trust, ethics, reimagining storytelling, diversity, brands and culture, like these are things that are you know, really emotional. These are things that you really need to like think about and address and solve. And a lot of the seminars focused in on this high touch element. The other one is trans like the technology transformation. And everything from, you know, proving impact and winning in the digital economy to like organizational behavior and how do you future proof your organization. So the real tension between like high touch and high tech we, we saw come to life pretty significantly in a lot of work and Again, like I'm a mom of two, like I feel this tension, like even just on a like daily level. 
So a little like trick that we do every now and then, if you're, you know, if you're traveling and you're at the airport and you sort of like stop at the newsstand, looking to see what magazine kind of like is front and center is always a really kind of good indicator of, you know, what, well, I guess what people are buying, but like what, you know, what are some of the big things that are um, kind of standing out at that moment. So every year when we go to Cannes, we kind of take a look at, you know, different airports, what are the big magazines that are out there. Last year it was HBR's, um, um, agile scale, you know, really data focused, really about organizational change. This year, economists, the world in 2019, and it's only in June. So just a really interesting kind of perspective of like some of the differences in a year um, that we're seeing. And, you know, this is a, per so now, this is now the film festival part of the presentation where Ian and I are going to tag team on a whole bunch of pieces of case study films from Cannes that really reflect um, a lot of these themes. And this one is from Volvo, um, and it really is the perfect combination of high touch and high tech. Women are 71% more likely to be injured in a car crash, and 17% more likely to die. The reason? Most cars are tested on male crash test dummies. But not at Volvo. They have collected real-world data since the 1970s to learn what happens during a collision, regardless of size or gender. What if we could use this data to make all cars safer for women? Introducing the EVA initiative. We collected all of Volvo's research and made it available to everyone in a digital library consisting of data from more than 43,000 collisions and 72,000 people. For the first time ever, Anyone could download the research and learn how it has led to some of Volvo's most innovative safety systems. To make the data more human, we gave the numbers a face and created a film that showed how this injustice affects women in a personal and direct way. Eva was introduced at a live streamed event where journalists and competing brands could tune in. The data helped us to understand the mechanism and the importance for all people. And we want the rest of the industry to do the same. Then we launched a global campaign across a wide range of media. The initiative quickly became news and sparked a global conversation about equal road safety. Event of kind of whiplash and, and injuries like this. But also, they're not just keeping the data for themselves. This uh, data and analysis that they've done is also on their website. So it's open to all car manufacturers to kind of improve safety for women in particular. Most importantly, this will make all cars safer for everyone. So whenever I see a case study like that, the first thing I usually think about is, um, what do you think the assignment was? Uh, That's crazy sounding. Yeah. <laughs> is that? Oh, oh. There it is. Check. You know, what, what do you think the assignment? Robin, what was the assignment on this one? Celebrate the anniversary of the three-point harness. Okay, so... Celebrate the anniversary of the three-point harness. Okay, so you got, a, you got a very simple assignment laid on your desk, right? That could be a super generic assignment. We just need to basically... What do we want to do for the 60th anniversary of a three-point harness, right? That could be something really simple. That could be a news release. That could be, a, you know, just basically cutting together some type of graphic or animation, pushing it out through social media. So it required, you know... Whoever delivered that assignment, you know, and maybe their passion or their enthusiasm behind basically the assignment itself, you know, you've got, you know, whoever the team was that, you know, ultimately took on that assignment and digging deeper and saying, you know, I'm not just going to respond with something that I can check the box and get this off my plate, but I'm going to find something that's meaningful and purposeful and basically bring that to the attention of my internal team, the clients and things like that. And then what, what's really interesting about, you know, this, you know, I, I'm a little bit biased. I've worked on automotive for a good chunk of my career off and on, you know, and I spent a lot of time these days in General Motors. I just happen to know that, you know, GM created the crash test dummy. You know, if you've ever been to the Milford Proving Grounds, you know, crash test area, they have all different kinds of crash test dummies, kids, pregnant women, all different sizes, you know, seven footers, you know, things like that. And they've actually moved beyond just crash, te crash test dummies and they're using a lot of data modeling and things like that. So basically what I'm saying is that anybody could have probably done this. Any of the larger OEMs could have done this. You know, what it took was a team to basically have a very key insight about, you know, female crash data 
you know, and then basically package that in a way where it's very easily to under, uh, easy to understand. Because if you're somebody, if you're a general consumer that's watching this that doesn't understand automotive industry, you're walking away from this basically saying that Volvo is the only one that is protecting me. You know, everybody else is out there, uh, you know, basically doing all their crash tests with, you know, male dummies and things. And how is that impacting me when that's not really the case? They just packaged it in a way and established a uh, leadership position. So I think, you know, you've got to you've got to look for, you know, deeper than, you know, when the assignments are given to you, you've got to look deeper than what's being asked of you and really figure out how do you find something like this, you know, that's there, you know, especially just. This is just proprietary data. You know, all of our clients have proprietary data, right? So it's about, fine, you know, some of that data can't be released for various reasons, but some of that data can be, you know. So whether or not any, uh, you know, other OEMs are really downloading this data and actually trying to make better safety tools, you know, probably unlikely, you know, because they're so much more advanced and they have a lot of access to the same information too. But the fact that Volvo did it and presented it this way and, you know, set it out there, you know, general consumers are going to believe that. Okay, the next um, takeaway is this notion that every brand, doesn't matter who you are, is a healthcare brand. So a couple of um, reasons why we believe this is a, a really kind of um, important theme this year and moving on. So it used to be that the um, Can Lions had kind of a separate area and a separate timing for the Lions Health, which was about pharma and kind of other nonprofits in that space. And now it's completely integrated into the main festival. So that, you know, that lets you know that you know, everyone's more integrated in that sense. Also, some of the biggest seminars and most well attended were really about healthcare. And if anybody follows WGSN, I highly recommend following them. A really interesting trend um, spotting group, and you know they travel all around the world providing trend oversight, uh, trend reviews. And this year, their their seminar was all about healthcare, and they just had so many poignant points that we think are going to become like you know can award winning. Um, cases next year. There was so much content. I mean, just this one, you know, any brand could sort of figure out how to jump into this notion of medical tourism. And these numbers are like insane, insane. But there were like, I mean, we were scribbling down stats from this session like it was nobody's business. Um, there was so much data that if handled in the right way and figured out in the right way, you know, that again, it's the high touch, high tech, figured out in the right way could really transform um, a lot of problems in the world. Just the idea alone of medical uh, tourism is kind of interesting to me, right? Like traveling for healthcare purposes, traveling for wellness. Right, it's like traveling for a yoga retreat would fall into that category, right? You know, so being able to know that that's you know a trend that's on the rise, and how do you basically look at, especially if you work on a, a transportation brand, how do you basically tailor messaging for that you know specific audience? And I think another big example of how all brands are healthcare brands, and I'm sure some of you have seen this case from IKEA, but IKEA won the Grand Prix in the health category. So we'll show this and we'll talk about it. Hi, I'm Aldo, 32 years old. Although I have cerebral palsy, I do everything I can to conduct myself like everyone else. But in my own home, of all places, I'm surrounded with furniture crying out cripple. I'd like to sit on a regular sofa without being afraid I won't be able to get up, to open regular closet, or even to turn on a regular lamp. One in every 10 people in Israel is a disabled person. The IKEA design vision gave birth to the Disables Project. Smart hacks making IKEA's best-selling items accessible. The project was created in collaboration with two NGOs, Milbat and Access Israel, and started off in the IKEA store with a hackathon of product engineers and disabled people that enabled better understanding of their needs. In the end of the developing process, 13 new products were born, each solving a different accessibility issue, such as sofa elevating legs for easier ascending, lamp button enlargement, special handles for PAX closets, and more. The new products are presented in the world's first accessible living spaces in the IKEA stores. The new models are available for download from the project's website, disables.com, and 3D printing anywhere in the world. So that Eldar, Dina, Pavel, Inbal, Moshe, Tahel, and Liel can also feel comfortable in their own homes like everybody else. Now they should come up with products that assemble themselves. <laughs> you know, so I don't know exactly what the assignment was on this one that led to this, but what I do know is Eldar was the copywriter on the team. So he probably got briefed on this assignment for, you know, IKEA, and he's like, 
I can't even really use the products, right? You know, and he had this direct, you know, connection to basically these products, wrote up this idea, brought it to the team, and probably found advocates to fight for him to surface it for the clients, you know, and then ultimately it led to product design, right? You know, so again, I don't think this is so much an idea that says that basically we all need to be going around looking at our clients through the lens of people with disabilities and figuring out how do we ultimately talk to that community, which there was a lot of winners in that space, you know, but it's again, like finding those little niche communities that your products have a relationship with or could have a relationship with, and then, you know, finding out, you know, surfacing ideas that make that connection. Big shout out to our colleagues at McCann because this was uh, one of the most winningest pieces of work. Um, another example too of to sort of every brand is a healthcare brand, you know, and and really finding your 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 niche community here is. I'm sure everyone saw the Super Bowl ad from Microsoft, the adaptive controller. We won't show the video for this one, but again, another example of you know finding a group that is either marginalized or doesn't have advocates and advocating for them. And I think like in the video game world too, like there's a history of doing that. So it's, um, it's this is another beautiful piece from Microsoft. Okay, next, um, all brands are challenger brands. That is a really big kind of thing we feel today. It used to be that brands would challenge someone and now I think we can all see brands are challenging something and that something could be very large in, from an advocacy perspective, from a political perspective, or it can be smaller from a helping the, a community, a local community rally to do something. But this notion that all brands are challenger brands, we saw come to light really big this year at Cannes. So there's a couple, of, um, a couple of ways that we see that come to life. One is in the introduction of new categories at Cannes, specifically in the culture and context category. It isn't about the size of the budget. It isn't about did it go global. It's about did it make an impact for that group that's important to them and locally relevant. Probably the biggest example, and obviously everyone here has seen this, of really um, taking on something and showing the bridge between the brand world and the real world is obviously Nike. So this is, um, if you haven't, obviously people have seen and talked a lot about this case, but maybe a lot of people haven't actually seen the case study video, so we're gonna show that quickly. Several people posting videos burning Nike shoes. Nike running is running straight the into a political controversy. People are so angry they're burning their own shoes. Colin Kaepernick refused to stand during the national anthem taking a knee to protest police brutality. Nike revealed Colin Kaepernick as the face of its latest marketing campaign. Believe in something, even if it means sacrificing everything. Is Nike taking a risk? I think they're taking a stand. Tonight, the first game of the new season, and Nike is running an ad featuring Colin Kaepernick. If people say your dreams are crazy, good, stay that way. Most of this country was talking about this last night at their dinner table. And I'm never buying another Nike product again. Nike's stock today dropping 3%. Who's going to win this cultural showdown of standing for the end? We are. Check this out. <laughs> <laughs> I went out today and bought me some Nike stock. Oh, yeah. I want to applaud Nike. Speak up. We're right behind you. This thing is bigger than just the United States, and I think it resonates throughout the world. Kaepernick asegura que es su Just do it. Nike stock reached an all-time high last Friday. I'm gonna buy more Nikes now. Nikes on the right side of history. So don't ask if your dreams are crazy. Ask if they're crazy enough. So again, it's like, um, you know, what was the assignment on this one? It was the 30th anniversary of Just Do It. That's not even a milestone anniversary. <laughs> that's not 25 years, that's not 50 years, that's not 10 years, right? That's kind of weird in the middle, right? So again, that could have just been really simple. Like, what do you want to do for the 30th anniversary of Just Do It? Well, let's just do a mashup of old TV spots, put it out as a video on social media, celebrating 30 years of Just Do It, right? It could have been done onto the next assignment. You know, they created the, you know, the Dream Crazy campaign. 
right, which really now will go down as like a next chapter in a very iconic campaign, right? And regardless of where you, you know, stand, like it has nothing to do with where you stand on that issue. It's the fact that that brand knew exactly where they stood on that issue. And that brand basically said, okay, we're going to go all in on this. We're going to, you know, regardless of what happens or what people think, we're going to basically, you know, rally behind it, you know, and they couldn't have pulled it off if it was fake. You know, if they had just hired Kaepernick, you know, to be the face of this campaign, you know, when, when the stocks started plummeting and people started talking about the campaign, they, they probably would have made, they probably would have panicked. They would have pulled some stuff, things like that. They did their homework. They knew exactly what they were doing. They knew exactly who their audience was. Colin was on their, you know, uh, uh, contract for years. You know, they never released him when he, uh, you know, got released from the 49ers. And basically, um, you know, so they were just basically, you know, raising awareness and drawing attention to something that they already believed in. You want to talk to this? Well, yeah, I mean, I think the, the big thing here is knowing your audience. I mean, um, knowing that your audience is liberal, knowing that your audience is college kids, ex-US, and, you know, this is just like a, a quick little view of, you know, understanding the shareholder value here and what really matters. So this notion of building a bridge between the brand world and the real world and figuring out the right way in which to kind of get involved in movements is, is really interesting from a marketing and communications perspective. And there's lots of different ways that you can kind of figure out how to dial into those kinds of assignments. And these are just three examples of different ways that movements have been kind of supported or amplified or, um, you know, brands have been involved in them. So three quick examples. Um, one is Roma. I don't know how many people here know Participant Media, film production company that does just like incredible everything from like Inconvenient Truth, Wonder, and you know the Oscar winning Roma last year about domestic workers in the US. They just have an incredible system of we're going to create um, an entertainment property that actually drives people to take action and we're going to make sure that like building up during and afterwards that we create an infrastructure that allows people to actually do things. So working with NGOs in advance of um, launching these films so that when you leave the theater you're like I want to do something and then they have something for you to do. Um, and, you know, Roma is a good example of actually, you know, action and policy changing as a result of participant media's sort of approach to movement. So I think we have a lot to learn from that, um, that kind of company. 5B, and um, we didn't get to show this one. Um, I don't know. I think I clicked through. It's my fault. But uh, 5B, I don't know if anyone's heard of this documentary. It's backed by Johnson & Johnson, and it was all about um, the role of nurses during the height of the AIDS hysteria in San Francisco and the role that nurses played in creating a ward for AIDS patients when they had no idea what was going on. They just knew that these patients needed support and nurses were the first to really jump on board there. Yeah, and Johnson Johnson is a, uh, is a brand that has always like stood behind nurses, you know, and when you look at kind of culture and yes, you know, um, if anybody's watched, um, uh, meet basically, uh, Meet the Parents, it's like De Niro uh, makes fun of Fokker because he's a nurse, right? So if you're a male nurse, that's kind of laughable. People laugh at that as a, you know, as a career option. You know, so what Johnson & Johnson did is they basically went all in on the funding of this uh, you know, documentary that basically raised a, a, you know, awareness of at a time when doctors typically always get all the credit, you know, and nobody would, no doctor, nobody would go near touching one of these patients because they didn't know exactly what the issue was. It was these nurses that kind of came together and said that these people need help. You know, so we're gonna, you know, we're gonna help them. So they they got all this old footage of, you know, you know when this was occurring back in the '80s. You know, um, they put together this documentary. You know, and J and J didn't really know what they were gonna get out of it. They just really believed in, you know, this cause and raising awareness of the role of nurses. You know, regardless of who you are. And they put, I say, what was it, something around like just under three million dollars into the initiative, and now they're basically, you know, getting all of that back. So. Yeah. And then, you know, looking at what Nike did, it's an existing movement where they have permission to be a part of it and really helping to make that movement kind of go faster. And, you know, um, you know, you can look at the work and you can look at the players behind the big pieces of work to really see what their kind of point of view is on the role that brands need to take in today's world. And again, it's about that challenger mindset because when you have that challenger mindset, it doesn't matter if you're like the most iconic company in the world, hello Nike, or you're an actual brand that people traditionally would call challenger, you think of things differently. So this is, you know, the Wyden and Kennedy behind all the Nike work, you know, looking at this quote, I think it's worth repeating, brands are borrowing equity from causes, but what are they giving back? 
So, you know, when purpose was kind of the all the rage, you know, seven or eight years ago as just kind of an entry point, it was it was much more about we're gonna do this and we're supporting this cause. Now it's much more about what are we giving back more than just financial. A uh, little Weber Shanwick plug here for our own CEO and president. Um, you know, but purpose has matured from add-on to mix in, mixed in. It has to encompass everything from employee engagement to external partnerships. So just that idea that, you know, you know, what are we giving back and how are we making sure that purpose is a part of the entire spectrum? And finally, if anyone saw um, the new CEO for Unilever make a pretty bold um, announcement and uh, unveil of Unilever's kind of you know, next iteration of how they're gonna show up as a company that often a lot of people will follow, saying that we're gonna dispose of brands that don't stand for something. It's, it's, uh, and you know, you've seen the trajectory they've been on to really um, you know, unstereotype uh, their brands and a result of other brands are, are taking note and are following. So they've done a lot of um, they've done a lot of really good work in paving the way here for you know so many other companies. And then the final um, kind of takeaway, which really actually leads into our big theme, is what we feel the the key role for a lot of brands are today. So it used to be that you'd see a bit more about brands infecting culture. Hey, that's cool. Let's jump on that. Let's like get ourselves into it, make it like super itchy, and then like after three or four days, like that little bite will kind of walk away, and so will X, Y, Z, whatever we've done. Now you're seeing much more brands being um, a part of taking whatever that context or cultural insight is and making it bigger versus just making it about the brand. And that's it's it's a small nuance, but we think it's a pretty big nuance um, and a positive role for brands to play in um, the forward movements of certain kinds of culture or cultural opportunities. So, ta-da, the big unveil in a very non-dramatic way I'm gonna do it, is we believe <laughs> defiance. So, what do we mean by defiance? Because that can sound actually kind of negative in many ways, but we, we don't mean it that way. We really mean the proud and determined opposition to authority. And you know, we think that there's just this notion that brands um, have really become the new revolutionaries. And you know, whether that's big brands like Patagonia and Nike, but there's, and we're gonna show you some work now, there are other brands that are taking, that are challenging things that um, they can help solve, that either governments aren't able to solve, or other groups um, need help solving. And the role of brands in really catapulting um, opportunities for communities is, has never been bigger. So this piece of work won the PR Grand Prix. It is really, really interesting. What's our little caveat here? Uh, for mature audiences only. Um, it's from Germany and uh, it does a really good job of showing this theme of defiance was shocked to learn that pads, tampons, and other menstrual products are taxed as luxury goods. I suspect it's because men were making the law. Right, Mr. President, men made the tax laws. Fifty years ago, German lawmakers, who were all men, decided to tax feminine hygiene essentials like tampons with the highest rate of 19%. But things like caviar, oil paintings, or truffles with only 7%. So tampons are the real luxury? Menstruation is luxury? Breaking the law wasn't an option for the female company, an online shop for feminine hygiene products. So how could we sell tampons for 7% instead of 19? We outsmarted the law with the law itself by selling tampons packaged as a book, because books are also only taxed with 7%. Hello to the tampon book, a book that is a packaging for tampons to save taxes. A book that is a provocative message of existing gender inequality in our tax system. Filled with 15 tampons and 40 pages of explicit content about your period. Your period that is still treated as something to be embarrassed of. The book sold out within a day. The second edition within a week. It put the unfair tax system on the agenda of influencers and media. 1650 Euro Steuern zahlt jede Frau in ihrem Leben nur für Tampons. Germany's largest TV networks started to put pressure on the German Ministry of Finance. 
The message became a political message, too political for Facebook, which temporarily banned the content. Leading female politicians and members of the German parliament started sharing the tampon book. The petition on change.org got more than 150,000 signatures. And now, the German Committee on Legal Affairs must officially debate the tampon tax. So they're making real change, right? I mean, I wouldn't expect just some creative team in a briefing to come up with an idea like this, right? <laughs> <laughs> like you've got a, you've got a, ha you know, like they obviously realize, you know, that they've got a problem getting their product to their consumer, right? And you know, and that was something that only could be changed, you know, by legislation. You know, so they found a really creative way to get around the issue while also raising awareness of the issue, you know, and then now they're actually, you know, you know, causing, you know, laws to potentially, you know, be debated, you know, because of it. So it's bravo really to the, that idea. It's really the perfect, like, description of defiance in a way that's positive um, and really understanding how you can rally your community around something that you didn't actually know was a major problem, but... But is. But that, uh, you know, that's one of those things, you know, a lot of us work on different brands and some of those brands are global brands, you know, having an understanding of if there's something preventing you from being able to get your product in the hands of your brand, how do you basically create the challenge against, you know, whatever that thing is. Exactly. So just a, a final couple minutes on some roundup themes and then one last video. I think like when you kind of sum it all up, there was a great quote, um, I think from RGA that really we felt kind of summarized you know, the call to action, I think, for all of us, which is it's really easy to play in the zoo. It's a lot harder to play in the jungle, but that's the place you need to play in order to make a difference today. And that jungle sometimes looks like the New York subway, I think. But um, I don't know, for me, that was a personal rallying cry, like, all right, let's real world, real problems. Brands can actually challenge something and, and make a meaningful impact. But we had to do a little humble brag of some Weber Shanwick work because yeah. we just, just you know. And it's fun. It'll make you laugh. We yeah. kind of brought this down a little bit. You know, <laughs> right back. Anyone know the Cleveland Browns? All right. Yeah. Well, not historically. I mean, I know there's maybe you want to set this one up. Well, yeah. Anyway. I mean, we're, we're, you know, some of us are probably Lions fans, so we can relate very well to, you know, the 0-16 the season of the Browns, you know. But, um you know, a lot of us, you know, we deal with sponsorships. Like, I know, like, on GM stuff, you know, we're MLB sponsor, we're All-Star Game sponsor, we're Country Music Award sponsor. And a lot of times, you end up delivering against those sponsorships and exactly what you're kind of told to do. You're going to get, you know, signage inside the stadium. You're going to get X number of social media posts. You're going to get this. You're going to get that. You know, this is a way to kind of really, um, you know, capitalize on a sponsorship and figure out how to tap into the culture of that audience. Every sport has that team. That team that never wins. In American football, that team is the Cleveland Browns. They keep losing. When are they going to win? In 2017, they didn't win a single game. And 2016 had been pretty brutal, too. So as the National Football League's official beer sponsor, we gave the loyal fans something to look forward to. And we did it in the only language we know. The next story combines two of my favorite things, football and alcohol. Bud Light placed victory fridges in bars across <laughs> Cleveland. The way the fridges will work is as soon as the victory is, is clenched, the chains just fall off the fridges. Cleveland Browns legend delivered to bars filled with special edition Bud Light, secured with a Wi-Fi controlled lock. Suddenly, the season wasn't about raising a trophy. It was about raising a glass. And for five straight weeks, national media attention shifted from the top teams to the very bottom of the standings. Bold prediction, I think those fridges are getting unlocked in the first month of the season. Oh, look at that. Hope and excitement started to return to the disheartened fans. We all know how this story ends. Touchdowns are winners tonight. With a big win. 635 days in the making, and with a click. The Browns have finally won a game, and the Bud Light victory fridges were unlocked at long last. Open up the coolers, free beer for everybody. The city went wild. so-called victory fridges are unlocked. It's maybe the greatest promotion in the history of promotions.
Finally, people are enjoying what has been long overdue. Well, now they're empty. You know, this is a good example of how do you take a local story, a really local story, and make it national, right? Like, you only could come up with this idea if going into the season, you understood what the storylines were going into the NFL, right? You know, so basically you needed somebody to work on this that understood and had a passion for that sport, or at least did their homework and dug into it, you know, to kind of find things. You know, so that, you know, that was just a great example of, uh, you know, activating that and, you know, bringing it to life. It had, you know, the technology component of it with, the, you know, the Wi-Fi, you know, locks kind of, you know, happening. There, there's a lot to like about that one. Yeah. And that's us. Thank you. So. Um, questions? <laughs> so, yeah, I we guess. can questions. We can mingle in questions. I don't know, whatever you want. Oh, yeah. oh, we got a question in the back. Yeah. Yeah. Let's go back to that for a second. So, oh, there we go. Whoops. Ah. Yeah. You know, so if you think about Kansas being pure advertising focus back here, right? You know, this was when, you know, they started to pay attention to, you know, basically brand activations that were generating lots of coverage, right? You know, and then it was that purposeful, you know, it was, it was the reasons behind basically what they were doing that wasn't just, you know, like Robin said, like manufactured, living in the world that, you know, you just kind of, the storytelling that you tell yourself as opposed to, you know, to playing in the jungle. Um, big data, we all kind of know when that hit, all of a sudden it was just like, you know, what do you do with this? There's all this stuff, you know, how do you make sense of all this data? How do you find the insights in the data? You know, and I think at first, basically data was just, it was just really overwhelming. There was just talk about data and it wasn't really about the, finding the hidden storylines in the data. Um, you know, then you kind of had, you know, with really kind of as social media was really starting to kind of mature, you know, it was all about content, you know, hitting people at the right time in the right place with the right message and what are you serving up on social and what are you serving up on mobile and what are you serving up on digital and what are you serving up on television and how are you two screening and all that kind of stuff, right? You know, then you went into like all of a sudden, you know, the internet of things world, you know, right? Where all of a sudden now, well, ooh, what can we do with this technology? And we've got sensors and, you know, all this, and smartphones make us superhuman, you know, and, and things like that. So, you know, what are people doing with it? What are brands doing with it, right? You know, a topic of diversity, basically diversity just across the board, not just in basically color and race and, you know, but just diversifying everything. Um, how, you know, I don't know, what do you want to talk scale about scale? Scale was just about like actually making things tangible and real and big. So not just doing it once and being like, that's the symbol. It was like, oh my God, we're going to like, we're going to show you how we're going to do this at like at large, in large quantities. Then you, you had like an election stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Moving out of the election, you know, there was a lot of, you know, brands that were playing in political space and, you know, and like, you know, that was probably the start of the defiance, you know, brands starting to take a stand and kind of show, you know, if they were choosing sides, you know, like for various issues. You know, business, uh, you know, was when they started to add the e-commerce categories and basically how is all this, you know, like this is great work and this is amazing stuff, but what is it ultimately actually doing, you know, at the end of the day, you know, for the bottom line, you know, so that got introduced there. And then now you're starting to see the blending of basically these kind of worlds really kind of coming together. So, yeah, that was very good. What do you think is going to be next in 2020? Ooh, that's the first time we got asked that question. I don't know. <laughs> I, I actually, no like, I, I can't imagine, like, if you look at what's going on here, this is societal stuff. I can't imagine we're going to stray from societal issues that need, you know, that are complex, that need simple creative problems, uh, simple creative solutions. I, I can't imagine we're going to stray from that. I mean, it, it looks like the world's getting more challenging than less challenging. So my... My personal feeling is like we're going to see an iteration of defiance, maybe something bolder, maybe something more rebellious, or maybe we'll see different groups come out and, yeah. and help help with the cause. Yeah, I, I think you might I like, I mean, we're just guessing right yeah. now, but you know, um, uh, the song, This is America by uh, Childish Gambino, won a can this year, right? Well, shouldn't that be in music awards? 
right? You know, uh, you've got, you know, we talked about the uh, entertainment company that's only creating movies and documentaries and films, you know, that will impact societal change, right? So, you know, I think that the question becomes, what's a brand? You know, do you have to you know, sell a consumer good, you know, to ultimately be a brand, you know, to play here? Or is, you know, could a brand be a person? As an artist, am I a brand? You know, and, you know, so I think you might start to see a collection of, you know, what used to be dominated by the, you know, the Unilevers of the world and the Nikes of the world and large automotive brands of the world and stuff like that, where it's like anyone and everyone can play. What up, Jason? You know, and uh, things like that, so. <laughs> <laughs> yes? I, I, I'm fascinated at how you have taken the idea of defiance and defined it and made it very profound. Um, I, I teach in fashion marketing and branding and e-commerce marketing and have been talking about cause-related marketing for years. And I've always been very proud of that aspect of our business. Yeah. There's something that we can do to give back. And the idea of making it so much more profound <laughs> and meaningful I think is going to be a very important role the brands play because the, uh, the communities need to, everybody needs to take on that role today. And I think, I, I, I find it fascinating that you have taken it to that degree because I absolutely believe that that's where it's going and I think that it, it, it <coughs> brings people back to feeling good about brands <clears throat> as part of what the brand has to stand for and it's almost yeah, and I think further to that point, I mean, everyone's seen these stats, like 95% of people couldn't care less if a brand existed or not. You know, like nobody's waking up in the morning saying like, you know, hey brand, come, I want to come hang out with you. So I think it's it's even more important. And, and, and there's a lack of trust with brands as well. So, you know, it, it is, you know, seeing the Unilever CEO come up with bold right. statements like that, that really, really um, I think really brings the defiance to the next level. Thank you for your presentation. It was awesome. Yeah. So I have a question. question. Um, so we live in a world of social media and instant access to data. There's, there's really just no go to the end here. when it comes to bias. So what is your opinion on when a brand reacts to something that strays away from their ethos of who they are as a brand, but it's reacting to something in society or a spokesperson or drama on social media or a complaint about something? when they really stray from who they are to react to what the masses are saying. Where is that fine line, in your opinion? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's your Pepsi moment. You know. the, uh, it's kind of the Pepsi moment. Yeah, you know. I mean, um, without, you know, I'm Canadian, so I don't like to put down anything else. We're, like, super positive and, you know, <laughs> all of that. Um, but I think there's a lot of clear examples when a brand tries to take on something that they don't have credibility to stand for or to back up. And I think we've seen quite a few of them in the past little while. And Nike is the best example of, in our opinion, of not doing that the way Ian sort of described. Like, they have, they didn't jump into something. <laughs> Mm -hmm. They've been building to that something, and it, it was the right thing for them to jump into. So, I mean, like, as a um, general theory, I, I do think you've got to know who you are, what you stand for, and, and jump into something that makes sense for the audience, but makes sense for you. I think consumers are super smart. Like, they, you know, there's backlash from people who aren't necessarily in your audience for things like Nike. Like, let's forget that. But when you jump into something that you don't have a right to be in, like, like, like they call you out like really quickly. And so, uh, you know, we spend a lot of our time figuring out the mechanisms and the process and blah, blah, blahs. But the, it is really important to understand who are the stakeholders that need to be involved in the creation of something that's gonna go out, whether it's in real time or whether it's in like long time, because you just, you have to, you need advocates and you need to have third parties and you need to, things to be backed up like they've never been backed up before. So. Do we think brands should jump into like you know moments just because it seems cool to like you've got to just really you got to you got to debate internally to determine like what's your role in that and I think it goes back to that slide where there's like the bug infecting culture and then the sort of back scratching like we're much more on that side doesn't mean you're not jumping into like pop culture like that doesn't mean that like Cleveland Browns like that's that's jumping into a moment, but doing it in a way that makes sense for Bud Light. Well, I think it's just the importance of basically having a brand standard, you know, or like. Um, or a steward, you know, whether it's, you know, it could be the CMO, it could be the creative director, you know, but somebody who's just paying attention to everything that's going through the system and making sure it fits who we are, you know, because 
Otherwise, there's a lot of stuff that can just get out the door, you know, and, you know, there's a big difference between branding and advertising, right? Branding is everything, right? You know, advertising is whatever fills the, you know, media insertions, you know, so it's like you need somebody who's just paying attention to, you know, so I see it all the time working on social media. It's like you see something trending, you know, somebody says, hey, we should come up with a way to, you know, engage with this Area 51 meme that's happening right now, you know, and it's like um, maybe it makes sense, maybe it doesn't, maybe the concept that the team creates might help you you know make that decision but what you can't do is just jump on every one of those moments just because it gives you an opportunity to kind of join a conversation so hi oh. Not be real. And I would guess that that might evolve to something that puts more and more emphasis on authenticity. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a good point. In terms of that authenticity, I think like with the defiance thing, a lot of brands are jumping up and kind of like virtue signaling part of it, where you know they are being part of these these things and they don't necessarily have that much to back it up. What do you think is going to be the line between the brands who decide to take a stand and you know do something and the the brands? Well, I, I, I don't know exactly, to be honest with you. I think um, I'm going to relate back to Unilever's CEO talking about woke washing. And I just, I think um, the lines are not going to be blurry anymore. I, I just, it's too easy to see what's under the hood. And quite frankly, on the other side, it's really easy for a brand to put stuff under the hood. Like, it's not difficult now to actually figure out like, what should we do that actually makes sense, culturally relevant, it's relevant, it's newsworthy? How do we have a call to action? How do we make something um, real and tangible and get people to stand behind it? And how do we make sure it relates back to the business? So I, th I think, like, the solutions are going to be um, really critical, and I think it's not going to be difficult to, I mean, look, we're all, like, we all, uh, what's it called, Arm, armchair, I can never get that thing, uh, yeah, our, armchair, uh, quarterback. armchair quarterback, like, we all look at all these <laughs> things that come out there, and, like, it's a sport to, like, to dissect them, but it's pretty easy to see the stuff that like has stuff behind it and the stuff that doesn't. I don't know. Did that answer? I'm not sure if that did. Maybe. Like maybe. Kind of an question. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I mean, like, most people think they are WebMD. They're doctors. So, I mean, if you just go to your doctor and you ask them the amount of times, like, people come in and have already diagnosed, and then they have to, you know, the doctor has to convince them, well, that's not, like, that's not your diagnosis. That's, like, a diagnosis. So you, you can just see that in your real life when you go in and you've already solved the problem, and then your doctor, who has years of experience, then has to debate with like a lay person why you, you do or don't or need that test or don't. So I mean, I, I, I think a lot of us see that in real life, but to see that stat, I know it was like, it was actually pretty, pretty profound. Well, we all do. Every brand's a healthcare brand. Yeah. Right, right, right. But I mean, it just still to this day amazes me that these ads for medications don't even really describe what the problem is. And you have like a heart murmur, and you're going to, you don't even know you have a heart murmur, and you're just going to go to the doctor and say, I want, you know, Antimo, you know, because I like their ads. Well, I'm not going to comment on that part, but <laughs> but I, I, I do think you know the more information consumers have, the more they feel that they um, that they're experts, and that's not just in healthcare. That's in your question about you know the lines. Like it is with more information, there's you know more responsibility on our part to do the right thing, to simplify the message, to focus it, to stay on track, so we're not just jumping onto everything, so they don't know who we are and what we stand for. Um, it's like. It's a lot of responsibility to be in marketing and comps today. Like fun mm -hmm. responsibility, but. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.
yeah. Responsibility, accountability, I'm good. Anything else? Thanks again, guys. I know that during the festival, I had bad week and Andy just things hitting my inbox three times a day, and I meant to <laughs> take a step back and look at all these ads and check them out, and I didn't. So thank you for forcing me to do that. It was inspiring and educational. And it was the right amount of time. <laughs> <laughs>